Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Bursts, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to the show. It's always great to be on your show. Hilliard, Ontario Premier Doug Ford has just said that parts of the Toronto Greenbelt now will not be open to urban development and will remain mostly wildlife preserves. Uh, kind of a political disaster for him. Two cabinet ministers resigned over it after the ethics commissioner found out that they didn't use a free and open process to bid on these uh, new lands. Yeah, the, uh, the the other the other aspect of that is because I, yeah, I don't know the political implications. Although I did I did note that the ethics commissioner uh, said that he would not be charged. Uh, the premier would not be charged, but. But the other thing that, uh, having lived in, in Alberta and watched Edmonton and Calgary, there's never been any problem in spreading out further and further into the, into the hinterland to build new, um, developments of housing. And I think that's part of the reason why housing prices are lower. They're not particularly low in Alberta, but they're lower, much lower than they are in, uh, around Toronto. So the, um, the, the, that, that land that was going to come out of the buffer zone uh, will mean that less uh, housing will get built. But, you know, I'm not entirely convinced that there's a shortage. I know that everybody is talking about a shortage of housing and we need more housing, but it's, it's not so much a shortage of overall housing because the percentage of money that's been going into housing in Canada is much higher than it has been in the U.S. and that's for at least a decade, if not longer. And it's the type of housing that's being built. They're building expensive high-rise condos rather than uh, affordable housing. And that's the problem. And and I'm not quite sure what the solution is, but uh, when you leave it up to the private sector, they want to get the most profit for the, for the um, per square foot of the land that they're using. And for a long time, that was expensive condos. Now that seems, there's stories now coming out of Toronto and Vancouver that people are, are uh, that have bought these pre-construction condo uh, contracts uh, two or three years ago are, are are now finding with the higher interest rates that they can't close on the deal, and that means there's going to be a whole bunch of failures of closures. So there probably will be some condos that will come free as the uh, as as the other people are f- unable to close, and that might free up some supply. But you know, 400, 500 square foot condo that doesn't really help a family that's moving to Canada from uh, from a country that has uh, maybe. Uh, um, they're used to having a uh, several generations living in one one house and several kids running around. Um, these 400, 500 square foot condos are just not going to do it. And uh, they were designed to go for for investors. And what we really need is is uh, housing for families. Also, a study by McGill found in BC seventeen thousand uh, potential rental properties are now short term rentals, Airbnbs. Yeah, and that, you know, that whole thing, you gotta wonder about how much longer that can last because, uh, you know, people, I, 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 I don't quite understand the point of traveling like long distances just to stay one or two nights in a spot. It's, it, I think there's a, uh, there's a certain, uh, adventure involved. There's certainly, a, a demand for stuff to post on Instagram, I guess. But, uh, but I don't know how that all that model works. It certainly doesn't help provide housing for families and and that's what we need well uh again vancouver now is upping the fee to a thousand dollars a year if you're going to have an airbnb property it was 
I don't know what it was, but it, I think a hundred dollars before is a thousand dollars a deterrent when you can rent it out for three hundred dollars a night. You've made that back in three days. Yeah, and what's the enforcement on that? I yeah. don't know if they. Collect I think all something like forty percent are unregistered. Yeah, I, that's the thing. And I, you know, I know that um, I was the executor of an estate, and I had to sell a a unit in a fourplex in um, Kitsilino. And it was, you know, it was just there was just four owners in the building, and the other three owners ganged up on me and said, "You can't sell it to somebody who's going to turn it into an Airbnb." And I said, "Well, I can't control who I sell it to. I just, I have to sell it as the executor. I have to get the best possible price, and uh, there's no control over who I sell it to." And uh, anyway, I, I don't know what happened. I uh, the the buyer was. Uh, well, it seemed like somebody was going to live in it and not rent it out on Airbnb, but you never know, right? So I don't know how you control that stuff. you got to have a team of inspectors going around to all these places and inspecting mm-hmm. whether they're renting them out night by night. or you know. Well, you it. could have a reward system for turning them in because neighbors know what's going on. Yeah, and those people, I know that uh, those other three people in that building, if it was an illegal Airbnb, they would turn them in a, on, in a heartbeat because they were really against it. And I can understand that because it would have really disrupted the 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 quality of life in in that building, but um, yeah, I I, I, I think the the solutions are more in the purpose built rental and the, and the elimination of the sales tax, uh, according to the developers, seems to they seem to be saying it's going to make a big difference to people. Were I think they were already uh, turning away from condos and building more and more pers- purpose built rentals. Yeah, the, uh, the, and the, the, the federal government yeah announced in Canada it's going to remove the goods and services tax on purpose uh built buildings for yeah, rental. And I don't yeah. yeah, I don't know like in Alberta there's no sales tax, but I don't know if Ontario and BC if they've if they've uh, volunteered to match that or not. I, I haven't heard that they have yet, but but it could it could uh, help. I don't know if it'll bring down the rents because a lot of the the buildings that I've seen that have been built as purpose built rentals are are still pretty expensive, you know, in terms of the the monthly rental. But um, but I think in um, when the bubble bursts, um, it'll it'll all sort itself of out faster than people expect. I know right now people expect that um, nothing will change, but the uh, the high interest rates that we've got now, uh, and they they are really starting to bite into what people can afford. It's it's taken much longer than I would have thought, but I think it is starting to have some impact on pricing, and that'll. And downward prices, uh, you know, it isn't, it isn't a positive for the older boomers that own the properties already, but for the younger people, it'll be a really positive thing. Uh, you know, at seven or eight percent mortgage rate, the amount of, uh, the amount of mortgage that the average person can, can handle is for probably in the two to three hundred thousand dollar range. And, uh, if that's what they can afford to, to borrow, then, Prices will have to come down to that range because that's where most of the people that buy housing, uh, they're using borrowed money. They're not, they don't show up with cash. <laughs> they, they want to, they have to go to the bank and, or, or another mortgage uh, provider and get a, get a mortgage. And they might be able to get a, a little down payment from mom and dad, the bank of mom and dad, but they still need to have that mortgage. Yeah. And how do you save uh, up for a down payment when you're paying over $3,000 a month for a one bedroom in Vancouver? Yeah, I don't know how people can do that. I honestly don't. And that's, and they might have a floor of a, of a house in, uh, way out in the stick somewhere for, for, uh, $2,600 a month or something like that, but with a neighbor above you and a neighbor below you. And, uh, it's, uh, it's quite the, quite the situation. And, you know, the, the other possibility is people could just move away from these high rent, uh, areas, but, uh, you know, there aren't that many places to move to. I, I, and and there has to be a job where wherever you're moving to, there has to be a job, right? Yeah, and when you said, how do you know what somebody's going to do with a, an apartment block when you sell it? It's much like the Harley Davidson dealers I've talked to in Vancouver. When they sell that motorbike, it's perfectly legal when it comes to sound that the sound that it produces. But I notice they also sell the kits that can take that muffler off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking it's, of muffler, the mufflers on motorbikes. I asked yeah. a, a a friend of mine who has a Harley Davidson, and he he just got back from a long trip with with, with his buddies going down into the U.S. And I said, I, I, I think the uh, the electric version is called Livewire or something like that. And uh, 
uh, I said, has anybody buy those those electric bikes? He said, oh, no. He said, you can't, you can't ride those things. They're too dangerous. And I said, what do you mean? They're so fast. If they're so fast, people are going to get hurt. I said, well, isn't that the whole point of having fun is to get a really fast bike? But the, he didn't. He didn't. He's a traditional. Of course, he'll never get a. He'll never get an electric bike. But uh, they are a lot faster than the uh, the, the old uh, gasoline powered. The hogs. For sure. the, the hogs. hogs. Do they cold. do they make them deliberately to leak oil? Is that a sign? Because <laughs> I I don't know. I I don't think I've ever seen a Harley that didn't leak oil. Well, they certainly have to make that sound, or else they're, you can't sell them. That's for sure. <laughs> now, um, now the uh, the Bank of Canada has paused on hiking interest rates. The U.S. Fed paused on hiking rates. The Bank of England paused uh, as well. I think. Does that mean that this is the end of rising rates and they're going to pause now, or will they just squeeze one more in just to say we're still trying to fight inflation? Great question. The uh, Federal Reserve on Wednesday this week said that uh, they were going to pause. They call it a hawkish hold is the term. They didn't call it that, but uh, the pundits are calling it that. And and the reason that it was a hawkish was that they paused, but they said we'll probably have to raise rates a couple of more times. Yeah, but the big thing that really shook the market. So the market dropped on Wednesday after the uh, after the announcement, and, and on Thursday it dropped again all day. Uh, and the markets are closing at the low of the day on Thursday uh, so the reason that that uh, that negative reaction was so strong is that they said we might not be able to cut rates until 2026. So they were expecting for the market was expecting several rate cuts in 2024 and now the expectation is they might not be cutting for a couple of years hmm. at least. And that so it, it isn't it isn't that rates have to go a lot higher. In fact, they don't have to go higher at all. It's the idea that people are going to have to learn how to live with with the current rates, which are in the U.S. The Fed, the Fed funds rate is around five and a quarter to five and a half. It's a range, and that means that mortgage rates are seven percent, uh, long term bonds rates are four and a half percent. It's it's a it's a whole new era. It's actually not new in the sense that if you go back prior to uh, two thousand and ten, it was normal. Back then, you know, the average the average mortgage rate up until 2007 was nine percent for three decades. Uh, it's only after the global financial crisis that we got all these new rates. If we're going back to those uh, previous rates, the prior to the GFC rates, um, we're going to be living with these rates for for a long time. And the problem is, how many people? With the amount of debt that is out there in the system that was not there before, the debt was not there before 2010. Uh, now that that debt is all there, both on the government side and on the private sector side, how will people be able to live with that? And uh, nobody knows yet. I mean, so far, people have not really changed their habits, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, consumer spending is still pretty strong. But uh, if they if they keep rates at these levels, a lot of people are going to have to make some adjustments. Well, uh, my local pub that shows NFL games, uh, it was empty last Sunday. I was the only person who showed up wearing uh, a Seahawks jersey to watch the Hawks play. Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe they the just place don't was like empty. The Hawks. Is, is that possible? They just don't but like the don't Hawks like the Seahawks in Vancouver. Ten percent uh, <laughs> of the Seahawks season ticket holders are from Vancouver. Oh, okay, so it wasn't that. Well, you know, I think you know, it's the prices. The food prices are outrageous. Ten they pieces are, of oh, yeah, six pieces of calamari for twenty dollars. I I could have rented the boat and caught it myself. And you know, people, some people do, but the majority of the people don't actually cut back on their spending as they get closer to the point where they where they need to. Uh, they don't. They carry on as if nothing is happening until they get a call from the credit card agency or the or the or the bank or somebody and say, "Hey, you know what? You're you're over your limit, and there's nothing we can do." And it's a shock to them, right? So, so that, that moment, um, is, happens when the lender realizes, not, not the borrower, but the lender realizes that they have to, to read it in. And of course, on the lending side, uh, you know, the last 15, 20 years, the lenders have all been, well, let's see how much we can lend. How many, how many people can we find and how, how big a, a, a credit limit can we give them? And if they go back to a, an era where um, 
where they start to be more careful as to who they lend to because they realize that some of the people won't be able to pay the money back. That's a, that's a, that's a huge change. It's a 180 degree change. And there's actually a, um, the term Minsky moment applies to the situation where, where the lenders realize that the people can't, can't uh, repay the debts that they've already got, much less give them any more money. Um, and this, there's some signs. So three of the major, the five big banks in Canada, three of them have a significant number of people, um, 20, 25% of all the mortgage holders that are not paying even the interest on. They're not, I don't know, they're not paying back any of the principal on their mortgage. And their, their monthly payments are not even high enough to, to pay all the interest on, the, on their debts. So, so that's the classic definition of when the Minsky moment happens is um, when the, the lender realizes that these people won't be able to repay their debts. And then it's a completely different relationship between the borrower and lender. It's no longer a sales job. It's a, it's a how nasty and mean can the lender be? <laughs> and uh, we haven't seen that for probably 35, 40 years, I guess. It, I would have to go back into the 80s when the last time they did that. What's their solution, Ben? It's not massive foreclosures because banks tell you they don't want to be in the real estate business. It's to extend the mortgage, the amortization period to, what, 30, 40 years now, 45? It's to infinity now, yeah. yeah. So what they do is they... they uh, in Alberta, they actually uh, they had a crisis in 2014, 2015, when there was that oil when oil prices went way down, and the the government owned uh, bank called the Alberta Treasury Branch just actually took out billboards, yeah. and the billboard said something like "We've got your back, Alberta." In other words, we'll help you get through this, and that, and this has been the trend for the last probably 20 years. Any kind of a serious setback, uh, the banks will work with people to say, "Okay, we'll restructure your loans." We'll We'll make some differences. We'll manage it, but it's but but we've never been in the situation up until now where people couldn't even pay the interest on their debts. So that is a whole new situation. And that was, and and the problem with this is, if the lenders are too accommodating, but the borrower realizes they're never going to be pay, be able to pay off the debt, then the borrower starts kind of gaming the system and saying, well. Okay, I'm never going to get out of this debt, so I might as well just milk the system for all I can do. And it happens with businesses as well. And that's why when uh, people apply for a um, a type of, of receivership where they, they're allowed to stay in control, uh, usually the bank um, decides that that's not going to work because the, the people in charge of the business just – they, they do all kinds of things like giving preferences to their buddies in terms of who they repay first and stuff. So they have to put a receiver in, uh, and the receiver get, kicks out the management and takes over the operation of that business to try and recover as much money as possible for the lender. So we're kind of at that, right on the cusp of that situation where they, where they turn from nice guy to nasty guy. <laughs> and in the 80s, the last time they really had a big amount of this, uh, they actually sent different people out they actually got rid of the sales-oriented staff for the lenders. But I'm talking about the banks primarily. Uh, and they actually brought in more like accounting types who were just, mm-hmm. they didn't have any uh, touchy-feely skills at all. They, they weren't trying to be your friend. They were just trying to re, re, um, get repayment of as much as the loan as they possibly could or to seize the assets and sell the assets. The problem with that is, and that's the, where the Minsky moment turns into a, a debt, uh, deflation spiral you got a whole bunch of lenders that have seized the assets and they start trying to sell them and who are they going to sell them to the you know the people don't have any credit anymore to buy stuff with and uh, the the more sophisticated buyers will step back and say hey we'll wait till uh, this is uh, this thing is shakes out a little bit uh, imagine how 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 much condo prices will drop in Vancouver for example if the whole bunch of people are cannot cannot close on these pre-construction condos that they put a, you know, a, de- a deposit on a couple of three years ago, um, there will be some fire sales. Now, we haven't seen much of that yet. You know, the, the banks are not, they haven't moved yet. So we'll, we'll see whether they do, but that's inevitably where it, where it leads to. Um, and I don't see what's going to, it's hard to imagine. You can always have a surprise. I've had many surprises in the last decade uh, being involved in this. Um, 
but I, it's hard to imagine what the surprise will be that would get us out of this without um, some serious readjustments. And personally, I think it'll be a good thing because it'll bring prices down. But but the other thing is it'll get rid of all the speculation in the system. The speculation, all it did was drive prices higher and made it harder for for the people who really wanted the the, the property to live in rather than to, as a as a as a as something to flip. Uh, if we get rid of those people that are the flippers. That'll bring uh, uh, prices back into line where it becomes more affordable, hopefully. Yeah, I, I'm also disappointed. We have governments that don't seem to have any focus. And if you ask the Canadian right now, they're worried about being able to afford food, being able to afford a place to live, being able to go to the hospital and somebody actually being there to treat them. And now we have forest fires uh, raging every year. And again, there's no concerted plan to deal with that either. So uh, four major crises facing the nation, and yet Ottawa seems, on their part, determined just to shovel as much of our money overseas as they can for projects that nobody here cares about. Yeah, well, the, um, it's, it's probably too much for them to handle at once. They, 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 their record is not being able to fix things very well, and it's certainly the housing file will probably get get uh, even though it um when when house prices come down and people start getting foreclosed on their properties no government has ever survived that in democracy as far as i know yeah I'd, if anybody has an example of where a government gets reelected after that after that happens i'd be interested to hear about it but as far as i know there hasn't been a case of a government getting reelected when house prices go down enough just to to uh, have people thrown out of their homes for failure to pay their mortgage so they might just have to let that one go and concentrate on some of the other things that are going on. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, governments, uh, they're not very good at solving these things. And even if they were good at solving them, they still might not be able to solve them. We'll have more with Hillary Macbeth right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought provoking podcasts radio and articles delivered to your inbox sign up for the howstreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at howstreet.com welcome back we're speaking with hilliard Macbeth. hilliard you're our electric vehicle expert you've owned a tesla for how long almost a decade now well uh not quite uh, yeah. 2016 was my first uh so i'm coming up to um in March, it would be eight years. Oh, so, wow. uh, yeah, I guess close to a decade. The, the, the model, the Tesla model, they did have some electric cars before Tesla brought out the first model in 2012, the Model S. Uh, but there were very few. And that was, that was the first one that I noticed that seemed like a exciting car to own. And so I, I, I bought it in 26. The first, uh, my first one was in 26. Now, now I'm on my third one. And, uh, my wife has one as well, so we've got two and two in the family. And uh, but you know, Canada and the U.S. are way behind. So the 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 leaders are in China and in Europe, and it, it's gone much faster than people expected. So we're now up to twenty five to thirty percent of all new car sales are electric in in both China and Europe. And uh, and it depends, you know, there's some some of them are hybrids, some of them are all, all pure electrics, but. But on average, it's about thirty percent. In the in the U.S. and Canada, it's less than ten percent. I think the U.S. is up to eight percent, which is a huge increase from two percent not that long ago. Mm. And uh, Canada's up to six percent. So, uh, and, and of course, Canada and the U.S. are the most uh, crude oil intensive economies in the world. So, uh, U.S. for example, I know the numbers better for the U.S. Uh, U.S. for example has about twenty million barrels a day of, of usage out of a world total of 100 million barrels a day, so 20% of all the oil burned. And uh, about half of that, uh, almost half of it, 9, 9 million barrels a day, goes into cars and light trucks. So if electric vehicles take over in a place like the U.S., it'll have a huge impact on the uh, on the amount of oil that's burned. Now, the, the, um, the, the Europe and China are, are much smaller impact because uh, they just don't have as many cars uh, per capita and uh and the cars that they do have are are um they're much smaller and they don't burn as much fuel so 
So, but in total, in the world, uh, about 49 million barrels out of the 102 million barrels that are uh, produced each day are used for transport in one form or another. So if half the cars go to, um, just to pick a number, half of, half of the U.S. cars and Canadian cars go to electric by, say, by 2030 or something like that, it'll be in the U.S. alone, it'll be four or five million barrels a day, which, you know, is only 5% of the 100 million barrels that we're talking about. But it's, it's a significant uh, number as far as the U.S. goes, because the U.S. is now the biggest oil producer in the world, and they only need to import about four or five million barrels a day. Most of that comes from Canada. So if um, if half the cars in the U.S. convert to electric, uh, they won't need to import any oil anymore. They won't need to go and meet with the Saudi uh, prince of whatever. The, they won't need to be nice to Canada anymore uh, because they won't need any oil from anybody. They've got, they got enough oil. Yeah. Now, BC has the highest number of EV sales per capita in North America with Tesla leading the pack. During the summer months of 2019, the Vancouver Tesla store was delivering upwards of 130 vehicles per day. Wow. That And that's well, an old stat. You see yeah. Teslas here everywhere. I even saw a pink one. Is Elvis <laughs> in the building? <laughs> I don't think pink ones are come from the factory. I think they had to get it re yeah. to do that. but. Yeah. I, well, the first one I got, it was the only the only place in Western Canada that you could have a, a a contact point was in Vancouver, and I didn't go to Vancouver. I just dealt directly with uh, with Fremont, California, where the Teslas are made in those days, and they delivered it on one of those big uh, transport trucks that you know you see on the highway that have like ten cars on them. Yeah. And they 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 sent one to Edmonton. And I just took delivery of it at the back of a truck in the in a parking lot. That's that's how I got. It. And uh, then I eventually, well, I had actually been out to Vancouver to visit out there. That's probably where I where I checked it out. Maybe I think I did a ride in one before I ordered mine. But uh, but now they've got service centers all over. Like I've got one in Edmonton, one in Calgary. They got them all over. And uh, uh, but what about know, charging maybe, stations? That's what everybody's worried about. They can't find enough charging places. Well, people with Teslas generally have not had any trouble because uh, Tesla's always built more, you know, built more charging stations that are actually needed. Now that might change uh, as Canada starts buying more uh, electric cars, but uh, up until now, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, and of course, most people charge in their homes anyway, right? They don't. They don't. Uh, the people generally don't go on road trips that often and uh, so the, it's uh, much uh, much simpler just to charge at home when the car is parked overnight uh, so but the new thing is happening with charging is that of course all, now all these other car makers like Ford and GM have got electric cars and their offerings are not that great but the, some of them like the Ford Lightning the F-150 electric version is actually looks like a pretty interesting vehicle but up until now they didn't have any good way to charge them so that was holding people back but now uh, Tesla has agreed to provide charging for those vehicles now, so uh, uh, that'll that'll have a big impact. And uh, of course, all the Tesla owners like me are kind of wondering, well, what does that mean? Are we going to have to start of line up behind a Ford F one fifty to get our charger? <laughs> so hopefully, they'll build enough uh, they'll build enough new chargers to uh, to to uh, to manage all that uh, new demand for charging. Um, the the other thing I've heard from many people say, oh well, electric cars, you know, the grid won't be able to handle all that demand for all that charging of the electric cars, and and uh, I, it's it, it's a it's an overblown fear because it's the same when you charge at home, uh, it's the same circuit that you use for your clothes dryer. So it's like if, if even if everybody in the neighborhood had a had a Tesla uh, or an electric car of some sort, uh, and even if they plug Everybody plugged their car in at the same time, which is never going to happen, but let's assume it did for a minute. It still would be like them all turning on their clothes dryer at the same time. It's not, not going to be that big a problem. There, there is a problem with, um, within an individual household. If you have two electric cars, uh, most people are getting their, um, their, uh, main panel upgraded to 200 amps from 100 amps. And that's just because if you had all of the cars plugged in plus the clothes dryer, Plus, you turn on the stove all at the same time. You might you might have a problem, but uh, in general, mm. it, uh, it it's doable. It's it's possible. And and the other thing, people don't 
you know, and this hasn't happened yet. It's, it's, it isn't quite ready yet. But the, but the uh, big new thing would be maybe five or 10 years from now that all of those batteries in those cars could be used to give electricity to the grid at, at times when the grid needs, uh, needs help. And so they could become a balancing factor in the managing the electricity demands of, of the community. Well, the ads so, for the Ford uh, F-150 electric lightning pickup uh, feature, hey, in an emergency, you can use the battery in your truck to light your house. Yeah, and there's enough in, uh, like, uh, the battery in mine is 100, 100 kilowatt hours. I think it's, yeah. it's enough to run your house for two or three days. It's not, wow. it's not, so all of these emergencies that people get, you know, with hurricanes and all that kind of stuff, it's kind of like, uh, it's a, it's a selling point to say, well, gee, I could hook my, my vehicle up to my house and I could, I could, if there's a power outage, usually power outages only last for a few hours. So there wouldn't be any problem running it off your car. So, uh, and, and so that's coming. There's no question that that's coming. And that actually in, in aggregate is not going to necessarily be like require a huge new support source of electricity. It just might be that people will get incentives for using their, their electricity at different times of the day. Um, certainly solar and automobiles might work really well if they could be, if the automobile could be uh, getting its charge when the solar, uh, in the middle of the day when the solar's at its peak. Uh, because the pro- problem with solar is uh, in the middle of the day, it gives too much electricity and then it doesn't give enough electricity uh, in the evening. So um, the car could become the, the, the transition. You could put the, solar energy into the car at three in the afternoon and then give it back to the house at six or 7 PM when it's needed. So there's lots of possibilities there, but, but the, the more immediate impact is going to be what happens to the oil market when, uh, when uh, 30 or 40 or 50% of these cars switch over to electricity. And uh, that is going to be something that uh, will have a big impact because crude oil is the biggest uh, financially anyway, the biggest commodity traded in the world. So it's uh, got the most volume of dollars. And, and uh, uh, there's a lot of people that make a very good living off of trading oil every day. And so they're going to be watching very closely to see how much uh, gets converted to electric. Uh, of course, crude is used for much more than just powering vehicles. It makes rubber, pharmaceuticals, plastics, yeah. things that you're probably not even aware of. So even if we uh, stop burning it to run vehicles and i'm sure a hundred years from now people will say you wasted crude oil to run your vehicles what idiots <laughs> yeah well, because it's so it. valuable for so many other things yeah and everybody uh especially in alberta people say to me yeah but crude oil is gonna be around for decades and that's true but it won't be to the point of 102 million barrels a day it might be 30 40 20 whatever however many barrels and the question, the question that nobody's really examined yet is who's going to be the supplier of that last 20 or 30 million barrels after it comes down from 100? And uh, the Americans, they do 13 million barrels themselves alone, and so they'll be self-sufficient. Uh, Canada does 5 or 6 million barrels. We export most of it to the U.S. Uh, Russia does 10. Saudis do 10. Um, it'll be interesting to see who is, who is the last man standing, so to speak, when it comes to, uh, and with the lack of investment in, um, in new oil production, which is already starting to happen because people are starting to see what's happening with, uh, with, uh, with demand. Um, it might become a scarce thing because it, it, you always continually have to keep investing to keep the production rate of, of, um, crude oil up. And if people decide, well, you know, it's not worth it. I don't want to be investing in a declining demand situation. Then there might be a bit of a shortage, but you'd have to bet that, um, and I haven't done the analysis. So this is just a, a, a guess, but I'd have to think that, um, the Saudis have a real advantage there because they're, they don't have to do all the extraordinary stuff we have to do. For example, in Canada here with the oil sands, they, uh, their, their fields are much more, much more, um, easy to produce from and they're much less expensive i think their lifting costs are four or five four or five dollars a barrel yeah i've also read reports that some of their oil fields that they thought had been drained are now filling up again wow that gift that that keeps on giving that fossil (laughs) fuel may not be from fossils but some kind of natural process within the earth 
Ah, uh, I never heard that before. That's yeah. interesting. Well, I certainly don't think there's going to be a shortage. Uh, you know, when I started uh, more than 40 years ago, the talk was peak oil. That was the big thing. Yeah. And they we're going to run out of oil. And uh, now it's very clear that we're never going to run out of oil. It's just a question of how much are we going to use, how much will we need, and uh, and uh, maybe they'll have someday be a scarcity thing. You know, they still use whale oil from the whales. <laughs> yeah, one time that was one of the biggest uh, use of you know before crude oil came along, and um, uh, uh, they still use it, but they only use it for very specific things that uh, very kind of valuable. Um, applications. So I don't know if the, if the crude oil business is going to go that way. Hilliard, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on right now? Well, you know, we talked about the uh, housing bubble a bit in Canada, and um, but there was a report recently that uh, I wrote about on my weekend note, which people are, have, are welcome to subscribe to. It's free. Uh, that there's uh, three countries in the world, China, well, uh, Korea, Australia and Canada that have the most uh, difficult situation when it comes to household debts. Now, China, I started to mention China. China is a little bit different, but they've ha- they're having their own uh, uh, development crisis, but it's more at the level of the developers and people that built these massive cities that have no people in them. <laughs> and They built too many of them, and, uh, and now they've got a crisis at the developer level. But at the household level, the three countries that were identified are Australia, Korea, South Korea, and uh, Canada. And uh, at that is those debts are around 100 to 110% of GDP, just at the household level. So that's one thing to watch for, is how do people in those three countries manage the, um, the debt levels that they have. It's, it's obviously entirely, or almost entirely related to real estate and uh, mortgage debt and that sort of thing. Hilliard, how can people sign up for your newsletter? Well, if they if they go on uh, Twitter or X, as it's called, I guess now they they'll see. I'll, I'll I tweet it on. It comes out on Friday afternoon, and I tweet up, uh, and then they can just link there, and then go right to the, or they can go to the website macbethmcleodpartners.com, dot uh, com, and uh, they can sign up with their name, and then they'll get an email with the, with the weekend note directly if they don't want to get it through uh, through social media. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. You can find him on what used to be called Twitter, now X, at HMACBE. If you have any questions for Hilliard or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on X at HowStreet. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.